absolutely. Thank you for that. And uh, probably a lot of what I'm going to cover here, we kind of talked about in the last session as well. So um, I don't want to, hopefully I won't be repeating too much, but um, feel free to fire through any questions as we go. Uh, so just a little bit more about me based on, on what we talked about um, in the last one, Is this button. How do you get the clicker working? The technology guy should know that, right? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Got it. So, 20 years in IT, still haven't used a clicker. Um, I tend to talk too much, but that's why. Uh, so that 20 years has been a student, service management, um, and I'll share some stories about when I was in service management, because that was the role that I was in that was closest aligned to RAPIs. So, um, I think Jason down the back might have been in the room when I gave the presentation on how closely aligned service management and, IT, um, and risk truly are. Uh, and now I'm a consultant and a business owner. And as it says up there with the logo, my company is called uh, the IT Psychiatrist. Uh, it's been in business about two and a half years now. Um, we celebrated two years during lockdown. Uh, and it's been a great journey. And I, as I said at the, during the panel, I, I work as a virtual chief technology officer and as a um, strategic planner with small and medium businesses across New Zealand. And I won't dwell too much more other than that the greatest mistake I ever made in, make, in naming my business was calling it the psychiatrist, the IT psychiatrist. Because hands up who could close their eyes and spell that without having to think too hard. It's not easy. Now, because we just came from lunch and we had the, the panel, I'm just going to do a quick icebreaker. I'm going to get everyone to stand up in the room and I'm going to ask the question, um, as, I, as I go through each one of those here, uh, I, I, I just want people to keep standing. If, they, if their business continuity plan specifically addressed any one of those, did your plan cover any one of those? Did your plan cover two of those in the last 12 months? Did you have something about that in your plan? What about all three? Hold on. Keep sta uh, sit, uh, sorry, keep standing. Sit down if your people knew what was in your plan for each of those three or any of those three. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and that's the catch, is we may have covered them in our plan. Uh, and what I'm going to talk through today is just how to build out that awareness of people of what they should be doing. Uh, and coming back to that incident management role that I talked about that I had while I was at BNZ, so that was while I was in service management, I was responsible for managing the incident process across technology incidents. We showed up to work one day um, in our office in Wellington, and there'd been a, a flood. The fire extinguisher, um, fire suppressant system had ruptured in the ceiling. Uh, of the 13th floor, it was a 13-storey building, it was up there, and it flowed all the way down. And when we got there, that office housed about 500 people. And technology showed up, there's about two of us that arrived at the same time, and everyone's like, oh great, technology's here, you'll fix this. We're like, we don't deal with water. And in fact, as long as all the technology systems are going, we've got as much of a problem as you do, because we can't get in and do our job. And everything was going, but it turned into this point where technology were the only ones who knew how to manage an incident, we've come up with, that bank has come a long way since then, um, they were the only ones who knew how to manage an incident, so it fell to us to manage incidents that were outside of our realm because people didn't know what to do. And I still remember that group of people clustered there um, as they were trying to figure out how to get into a building that they needed a snorkel and mask for. It wasn't quite that bad. Um, I just want to quickly cover two things in here because there's, there's two pieces to, to this as well that we haven't necessarily considered or talked about during the, the last panel session and many others may not know. The bridge itself isn't just a key piece of infrastructure for getting people from one side of Auckland Harbour to the other. It also happens to be a key piece of infrastructure where communications run. Not, a, not only one way across the harbour, they come back the other way. And we found that out when we were moving data centres in Auckland with, with the bank I was working for um, a few years ago. We were trying to find a data centre that sat uh, at a point that wasn't dependent on the bridge. And we found that there's nowhere in Auckland that's not dependent on the bridge because comms run up one way and then come back the other way. So while it creates a nice loop and goes all the way around the top, if the bridge was to fail, it would take a lot more out than just traffic. And it would take a lot of communications and a lot of power out as well. So that's something that, that hasn't really been known about. Um, the other one, and I went digging into this, I didn't literally go digging because that makes it sound like I did try and find it. Um, but a few years ago when the gas main to the airport ruptured, what I found was there's a point, and I've, I've located it to about QMU, the gas pipe from up north to the Auckland airport crosses over New Zealand's internet link. So they cross at some point. Now those are two key pieces of infrastructure. 
Um, at the very least, I'd have expected to find that they crossed inside the airbase air, air out in Fenuapai because it would be kind of nice that the defence looked after it, but no, it happens to just be beside the road somewhere. So we've got risks in there that we haven't really been thinking about as a country. The other one I want to talk about is the uh, volcanoes. So Auckland, a lot of volcanoes. Um, which volcano do you think presents the biggest risk to the, to the Auckland city and why? Anyone want to hazard a guess? likely to be a new one, but it may not be. Potentially Ruapehu. A couple more around that as well. Taranaki, um, Ruapehu. Uh, now, I'm, I'm having to read this one. Over the last 12,000 years, Auckland, on average, has been covered in ash every 400 years from one of those other volcanoes. So, yes, we are going to have to worry about the one we don't know about, but we also have to deal with the fallouts from the ones we do know about. And I think the stats were... No, I haven't got the stats on how long it's been since the last one, but roughly every 400 years, Auckland gets impacted by another volcano somewhere outside of the city. And that's a piece that we're going to have to start thinking about as well, because that will start, as we saw with the bridge, as we saw with COVID, that's going to start making people think differently about how they live and work in Auckland. I'm not going to dwell too much on that, because um, the more I think about it, the more worried I get as well. Um, so what I want to talk about is one of the problems with risk. Uh, and then I want to talk about how we drive that culture in as well. One of the challenges with risk, and, and I was having a chat, I think it was with Anna over lunch, is that we have so many terms to define risk. You know, risk is not just risk. This is just a few of the samples of what risk is to many different people in business. Yet if we talk to someone who's not in the risk industry or not involved in a risk role, they don't necessarily appreciate that. So they try and put their own lens into it. They don't necessarily think that there's um, operational risk or cyber risk or conduct risk. And so they're acting as if risk was just this one big thing that someone can take care of. But like technology, like health, health's one, I wouldn't want to go to a brain surgeon to get, to, to get them to fix my hip. And equally, I wouldn't want a hip surgeon to fix my brain. Risk is the same. You can't just put one person in and expect them to be able to manage every single piece of risk your business may own. You have to start holding that conversation um, and holding it in a way that people understand. There's also a range of different places that risk can come from. Now, this is a list from, um, I got it off a site called Protivity. This is the top 10 risks that were meant to impact the world in 2020. Funny thing is they actually did, in some way, shape or form, impact the world. The thing is, what caused those risks to be realised probably wasn't what we expected it to be. COVID definitely, definitely caused economic conditions uh, impacting growth. It most definitely caused the ability uh, to compete with Born Digital and other competitors to be realised. We saw companies that hadn't invested in their technology struggle to work from home versus companies that had evolved in the last 10 or 15 years that just, just like that, because they had put the systems in place by chance. Now, it's not an easy thing to do to say every company needs to go and be digital ready to work from home, because in some cases, it's like turning the aircraft carrier versus turning a speedboat. They've got 60, 70 years of legacy behind them, that they can't just switch off overnight and bring something new in. So there's a big plan that's got to go in place on that. We need to be forecasting forward. And I talked before about digital twins. Uh, digital twins play a great role and a huge benefit in helping companies start to plan and shift. You know, they can start to focus on what's important, what needs to change first. Uh, just prior to this, I was sitting down with a, with a client. We're working through their roadmap at the moment. Um, he's got a lot of staff who are out on the road. It's a new client. Uh, a lot of staff are out on the road and they take paper with them, paper that thick when they go and see their customers. And then at the end of that, they record all the conversations. One of the early things we'd, he had talked about to me was, can we get tablets for these staff? And I said, well, we can get tablets, but we need to figure out the document management system first. There's no point in giving them the piece of glass if we haven't figured out how to digitise all the paper they're taking with them. So we need to start planning that out as a roadmap. And that's where some of those digital twins become important. And that's at that top layer. That's at that management and executive layer, thinking about what needs to change in my business in order to be ready for the future risks we're going to see, because I don't see this, this list changing too much. Uh, the numbers, if you can't see them well enough, the right-hand column is the 2019 rank, um, and the left-hand column is the 2020 rank. So some of those, uh, there's only one new risk on there. Everything else is pretty static from where it was. The only big change that I see is cyber threats, which is currently number six, is going to keep going up. We talked about um, the stock exchange being hacked recently. 
uh, we talked about the impact from uh, the loss of Microsoft Office 365. It's a cyber threat because we are dealing with the internet and we are dealing with something that's very volatile uh, and complex as well at the same time. Just on cyber, hands up, who knows what is significant about this week? Yep, Cybersecurity Awareness Week. America has a whole month dedicated to it, all of October. New Zealand budget constraints were a bit smaller as well. This week started yesterday, finishes on Friday at Cybersecurity Awareness Week. The fact that there's only, what, two people in the room who, who knew that <laughs> um, suggests that we haven't done a very good job of communicating to everyone that it's Cybersecurity Awareness Week and what that means. We've got some agencies out there doing some work, but they're putting the onus back on businesses and back on the community to try and educate us what cybersecurity means. Uh, and just yesterday, I was sitting down talking on cybersecurity, sitting down thinking about what the three impacts or the three challenges we're going to see over the next three years are off the back of the election. Not as a result of the election, but just off the back of the election, how the government might deal with them. Cybersecurity is going to be one of the ones that keeps growing. I mentioned the number of grows 10% each year. Now, that's um, compounding. So 10% on 10% on 10% on 10%, we're seeing more and more threats. And the, the point becomes that if your information is valuable to you, it's probably valuable to someone else who's going to try and steal it as well. I can't remember off the top of my head, but over 50% over of companies have been secure in cybersecurity at some point in the last few years. So these are the kind of things we're still going to see more and more of. They're not going away just because COVID's gone away. Not that it has. So where does all this risk come from? All right, they've come through. Humans, people, us. We can blame technology as much as we want, but technology constraints are caused because someone made a decision not to invest. Someone made a deci decision not to change. Someone didn't quite capture the process properly, or if they did, someone else didn't quite follow it properly. If we think back to um, the runaway millionaires from Westpac a few years ago, every control in place didn't stop them getting $10 million that they shouldn't have got and then leaving the country with it. And it was a human error that caused that, an unfortunate human error. But it comes down to most of the risks that are realised are resulted back to people in some way. It's not technology's fault that it was not configured correctly. It's not the process's fault that it was not being followed correctly. It's the person who didn't follow it that we need to be looking at. Now, that's not to say we need to blame them and hang them out to dry, um, but we certainly should be looking at it from the point of view of where is it that we need to spend most of our money. And most of our focus should be on people. 90% of cyber crime or cyber related data breaches in the UK were because of human error and people. The numbers aren't far, diff uh, aren't far off from here either. I think it was about 83% for New Zealand over the same period. Uh, I just couldn't find a quantifiable source to tie back to. So at least this one's uh, verifiable, but it's not too different here. It's not too different in America. And if we think we're immune, we just have to look at the breach that we had with, with, the, um, with the stock exchange. We had Kathmandu last year. I think the police had a data breach at some point in the last 12 months. It's happening in the country now. That just shows that it's not going to go away. We still have the volcanoes. We still have the bridge. We still have the core infrastructure. And we have a city that's running out of, uh, running out of water despite being surrounded by the three biggest harbours the three biggest harbours in the country and one of the biggest harbours in the Southern Hemisphere. And yet we can't figure out how to make that drinkable. So we've got to start thinking differently. And we've got to start dealing with our people. We've also got to start thinking about our language. Uh, and I talked about this yesterday with a, a guest. I run a podcast channel and I'll, I'll share the link with that later. Um, I talked about this yesterday that from a technology perspective, we're really good at coming up with words that nobody else understands. Uh, Z Scaler was one we talked about on that, that episode, but there's WANs, there's SD WANs, there's all the stuff that nobody understands. And, and that got me thinking about risk uh, and, and what language we use. And this was uh, just a word cloud that I came up with from Deloitte's 2018 Global Risk Management Survey. The roles of the risk team, the board risk committee and any risk committees underneath them. Establish, assist, monitor, conduct, define and approve. And I took that verbatim from that list there's one word that I think is missing from there. Does anyone want to hazard a guess as to what they feel might be missing from there? Challenge. challenge as in challenge decisions, management, perspectives. Yep. The question I've got is who's talking about it? Communicates not there at all. Discuss is not there at all. This is stuff that... The, the, the people that are tasked with risk in the organisation should be doing, they should be communicating and driving. 
They should be talking about it in a way that the people understand and actually starting to humanise it a little bit. The impact of X means Y and what that can mean for you. You know, if COVID was to hit New Zealand, if we go back to February, we should have been having that discussion at the high level. If COVID was to hit New Zealand and the government's response was to lock the country down, what does that mean? How do we deal with it as a company? And then start to have that conversation out there with the people. Uh, and I think from an executive layer, it's perfectly fine to not have the answers on that one. Because no one here has lived through a pandemic on the scale that COVID was. So why should we expect the executives and the politicians to have the answers? We should be having a discussion around what it means and what we think could be happening. And that's who we need to make responsible. Everybody in the organisation should be responsible for managing risk, communicating risk, making decisions around risk. You know, Cyber Security Awareness Week, I'll come back to that. If you were walking down the street and you found a USB stick on the ground, what would your first reaction be to that? Would it be to pick it up and put it in the computer to see who it belonged to? Or would it be to just throw it away? Or would it be to leave it there? I'd say the best reaction will be to throw it away on the assumption that it's probably got something malicious. And the reason I say that and not just leave it there is because if you don't throw it away, the next person to find it might plug it into a computer. The second one, if you're sitting at a desk, you leave, you come back and there's a random USB stick left on your desk, do you plug it into your computer? See what's on it? See who left it there? Again, I'd say no, because you don't know what's on it. So it's starting to get people to understand that the decisions they make can impact the organisation in a big way. Someone could have snuck in, and this does happen, um, snuck in through the security controls, the physical con security controls, left a USB stick on your desk uh, on the hope that you would stick it in and uh, activate the virus that's running on it. And it has happened. I think uh, back when I was working in the banking industry, we had a lot of um, online learning around how to deal with um, people who shouldn't have been in the premises when they were because of uh, privacy concerns. So these are the kind of things we need to be making people aware of. If something has changed or something's not normal, don't just think about, oh, we'll plug that in and see who it belongs to. Take an action that's a bit different and maybe throw it in the bin. And if someone turns around and says, oh, that had all my, I don't know, um, all my budget forecasts for the next five years on it, it's like, well, why was it the only copy? If it's that valuable to the organisation, why were you carrying it around on a USB stick and not storing it somewhere safer? How do we make them responsible? Clear, consistent communication. And I'm just going to play a snippet from, from the podcast that I mentioned. This was uh, an interview I did with Hilary Walton, who's the Chief Information Security Officer of Cordia, uh, telecommunications and technology company in New Zealand. Uh, and what she shared I thought was relevant for this room as well because it talked to how we make risk meaningful for everyone. Something I've been thinking about in my work with Cordia, uh, like how you communicate. So, for example, security policy and how you communicate that to staff is, um, is evolving. And one of my colleagues, uh, Stephen Coates, he talks about policy 3.0, where yes, you produce your security policy, but then you kind of park it on the shelf. Mm -hmm. and then you turn the policy into as many different communication channels as you can. Mm -hmm. So you might turn it into a meme for those people who learn by memes. You might turn it into video um, or um, talking head or an animated thing or whatever it is that more and more we need to communicate with people to, to their natural style. Like mm -hmm. That's what you're talking about with your colleague, wasn't it? Like it, your absolutely. natural style was not email. <laughs> so you changed it. But but it's diff it can get difficult when you're trying to do that en masse. Yep. But that if we want security to be effective, we need to find a way to do that. You know, right. like people learn by checklists. Hmm. Um, numbers, one, two, three, whatever it is, uh, how can we, crossword puzzles even. <laughs> Cross, crossword puzzles, even, even storybooks, connecting people back to the why. Why, why, yeah. why is this important? So some of the stuff she talked about in there was different to how many companies would normally communicate policy. And some companies don't even communicate policy uh, within the organisation. They have the policy document, they leave it on the shelf and they expect everyone to know what's in it. And then they wonder why when there's... Um, a dispute, the employee wins because they didn't tell them what was in the policy. They didn't help them understand um, how to avoid risk. But I don't know about you guys, I've done some policy writing um, over the last few years and you've got to be a special type of person who actually wants to sit down and read policy and understand everything that's in them. And not everyone wants to do that. There are different ways we can be communicating with people. Hillary talked about crosswords in there. A crossword puzzle to tell people what's in your policy would be a great way and a fun way to, to engage them. 
uh, but it's not going to work for everyone. So videos, memes, just different ways of communicating with people, but making it clear and consistent. If you do a crossword puzzle and you do a video and you have a talking head or an ask me anything panel, make sure they say the same thing and that they're not inconsistent. We don't want to get into that situation again where we've got level two, level 2.5 and level three, and we're not quite sure what the difference between the two is or the three is. And the reason why it's important to communicate with people in different styles is that our organizations don't look like this and they haven't looked like this. They've never looked like this. They've always looked like this. Different backgrounds, different people, different personalities and different cultures. Uh, you hear the stories of people that have gone and worked in India or in the Middle East, um, Kiwis, who, whose work ethic is, well, if I show up at 6 a.m., um, I can leave at 2, uh, at 2 p.m., and that's my eight-hour day done, only to find that their staff are coming in at 5.30 a.m. and still not leave until 5.30 p.m. because their work ethic is get there before the boss and work until 5.30. So we've got different communities. We've got different pers uh, personalities, perspectives, and people coming through, and we've got different choices. I know of plenty of people who have taken flexible working to mean that they will start work at 12 o'clock in the afternoon because they don't like to wake up early and start working. They like to sleep in and they're more productive later in the day. I know people that have gone the other way. They'll get up early and they will be productive right up until midday and then they'll stop and they'll go for a round of golf or they'll go sailing or they'll go and do whatever they want to do because that's how they work and that's how we need to start communicating with people to build the culture we need to do is accept that everyone is different. I'm looking around the room and I can't see two people who are even remotely similar in this room. And that's indicative of what our organisations look like. They are different. So let's communicate to people in the ways that they understand and that the ways that they're going to work. And if we can get that right, we'll start to build the culture we need and we'll start to get that accountability and those decisions made that will stop some of the things that we've seen over the last 12 months from happening. We can't stop the bridge from breaking, but we can make damn sure that when it does, our people know on Monday... I don't go to the office, I take my laptop out and I start working. Shouldn't even need to be told by management and they shouldn't need to be going back to management and saying, I've made the decision not to work in the city today. It should just be clear that they're online and they're productive because that's the best way we can get the risk culture going in the organisation is to get people making decisions for themselves and thinking of what's best for the organisation. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for all the questions earlier as well. Uh, these are just some of the channels that I'm available through. Um, if you want to ask any questions um, now, then I'll be sticking around for a little bit. Uh, I'm fairly active on LinkedIn as well, so, so do feel free to look me up there. Um, and uh, BizBytes is the podcast that I mentioned, www.bizbytes.co.nz. Um, episode 32 went live this morning, and the guest from episode 31, Janet Chenery, is in the room as well. Um, so you'll hear her talk about reg, reg tech. Uh, but we've got a range of different topics that we're covering in there. We're covering um, one of the very early ones was uh, remote leadership during a crisis, where I spoke with the CIO at BNZ, who was CIO during the Kaikoura earthquakes, which uh, caused our building to be uninhabitable at the time. Um, so he's got some great learnings from lessons from crisis management and remote management during a crisis. We've spoken with, uh, I should know, there's 32 people. <laughs> I've spoken with Hillary, obviously, from a, from a cybersecurity perspective. Risk comes through in a lot of the themes. And if anyone does want to appear as a guest and talk about it from a risk-based topic, then please do send me an email because I'd love to have you on as well. I'm always looking for guests. Um, but thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, any questions? I think it's very, very insightful. One of the, the things I, I liked the, the most or I thought was quite impactful there was that many of our risks in the organisation are internal. Um, and a lot based on human error. And when we just stop and think about that, um, maybe we need to you know, orientate some of our systems a little bit more around um, uh, dealing with that risk, not, not for the sake of blaming people, because I think that's counterproductive, but having systems that will help people um, avoid or, or manage that risk. And maybe you've got a, a few further um, in, insights on there. Um, any, any questions that... Somebody wants to to raise. Would you have any any kind of suggestions around how we can get some visibility around risks? I know a lot of organisations are trying to use IT and, and technological systems, um, whether they be tracking in machines or or many devices, to actually turn what people are doing into some sort of data that can then help. As a, as a trigger or a key risk indicator that something's not right. So yeah. maybe I'll, I'll throw that open to start with. 
Um, it's, I think within there, it's just understanding that technology itself is not the answer. It's not the solution. Um, it's the tool that's going to help the solution to occur. So don't throw systems in and expect that they will start to service all your data um, and show you where your risks are. Because if you haven't figured out how you're capturing all your data and you're not putting it into the system that you want to use, yeah. you're not going to get the outcome you need. So, so technology is not the answer. Um, it's, it's just the way that you will find the answer out. And we've seen it a lot with uh, companies that have, and in fact, I'm actually going to share this one because this is Spark has recently um, upgraded their voicemail and they now have an AI based app, which translates your voicemail from text, uh, from voice to text. Um, and I just need to bring that up. So, this was a friend of mine left a voice message, which uh, he said, hey, Ants, sorry I missed your call. What it was translated to was handsomest a call. I thought it was very generous of him. Um, another one, uh, Ants, TK here, mate, got translated to pants, take a hammock. <laughs> and what was the last one? Um, uh, oh, it's, it's just the fact that I've been given, uh, I've been called aunt several times. Oh, and this one was uh, from another guy called Anthony, Anthony from AT. So it's Anthony from Auckland Tourism Events and Economic Development here, translated to, hi, Anthony. It's Anthony, give them from different rules of its rightful owner. <laughs> <laughs> didn't help me. Technology seems cool, but it didn't help me. The only, there's, there's one message there that the technology's helped me, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. It hasn't helped me because I've had to listen to those messages to find out what they're saying. The one message that it has helped me was the one that I got last Sunday. Um, Hello, my name is Biana, and I'm finding you today from one of the local, local Jehovah's Witnesses in the area. That was translated perfectly. I knew I didn't need to call her back. <laughs> there wasn't a chance I was going to want to talk to her. But the one that I found funny, and if anyone's ever seen the Scottish elevator t um, video, it's a voice-controlled elevator in Scotland, and they can't get to level 11. The only voicemail that has been translated perfectly in Spark's app, 100% accuracy, is from a Scotsman. And he thought he was onto a winner if an AI could handle him. So, so it's just a great example of don't throw all your eggs in the basket of technology because it's going to come unstuck. And AI is a great example of where what you expect to happen and what actually happens aren't the same thing. Um, Microsoft, a few years ago, released a Twitter bot called Tay. Uh, really good case study on why you don't let AI out in the world without training it to not be racist and anti-Semitic and a white supremacist because within 24 hours it was all of those and it was turned off. Um, same thing happens in companies though, internally. If you start to bring in systems to track risk, you'll get a lot of false positives and a lot of false flags. Um, so be prepared to find the problems first and be prepared to make sure that you understand what you're solving before you put technology in to solve it because it may solve a very different problem or cause a different one. Very good examples there. Mm. <laughs> any any questions? It's a little bit. It's probably uh, quite specific to um, fishing and IT, but uh, just these fishing, you know, uh, I guess um, simulations, and uh, you know, you get these through, and uh, they are getting very hard to pick up. You know, and then you'll get another email from. Um, you know, you go through for Power BI, it'll ask you to validate your password and ID. And there's a, and there's a few ways of picking it up, but it's become really, really difficult. Mm. Um, and I just wonder how effective this is going to be even in four or five years' time and, and whether we're going to have any defences to that at all. I'm not sure if you've got any thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a good question. And, and I'll, I'll take it back a bit for when I was at, at BNZ and we introduced our battleship card. If you're all familiar with what I mean by the battleship card? So if you're not a BNZ customer, the Battleship card was their NetGuard, their first evolution of NetGuard, and it was a multi-factor authentication. And it, it allowed, you, you signed in with your username and password, then you had a card with five by five or seven by seven, um, and it gave you three coordinates, and you had to find what was on the card and put those coordinates in. Less than 24 hours after we released that, the first phishing email was coming out with a, with a copy of that, all branded perfectly, copy of that, and the grid saying, dear customer, by now you should have received it to validate it's your card. Can you please go and enter all the coordinates into this grid? So they're already adapted to that, and we're going to see it more and more and more. And I know um, Zoom, there tends to be a lot of spam about Zoom, log into this website. And I think the only way to, to, to um, defeat it is to continue to communicate with people. You know, the things that you don't do, the banks that sit there and say, we'll never ask you for your username and password over email. Um, 
just educating staff what to look for about how to hover over an email address to find that it's not the legitimate one or to look for those tells that are in there. Um, and I read recently as well with, with a lot of phishing emails where it's dear sir or madam, please, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of spelling mistakes in them. And apparently, apparently, I, I can't validate this against anything. Apparently, the, the spelling mistakes are deliberate to weed out the smart people and capture the naive ones. Because we'll look at it and go, oh, it's fake and delete. But there's people out there who, won't, who, who aren't good spellers themselves. They won't pick up on that and they'll go, well, this might be legit. And they'll follow through. And that decreases the chance that they'll get caught because the ones who would have, uh, the, the ones who would have picked up on those spelling mistakes would have reported it. And now it's not getting through. So it's communication. It's just reminding people and reinforcing that message over and over again because it's going to change. It's going to change fast. Good question, though. Any other questions? Um, what's your view on um, those sort of behavioural analytics type tools where, you know, you can sort of watch over someone's shoulder and, and track what they're doing and how they act online and all that sort of thing, you know, good risk management or sort of big brother gone mad or, you know, and, and the impacts on culture potentially? Um, I think it comes down to what you're trying to solve with it and, and why you're bringing them in and what you're telling your people as well and then how you're using it. It comes back to that consistency and that, that being on message. If there's a reason you need to do it, you know, if, if we didn't trust people, we wouldn't have video cameras over the cash registers at the supermarket. Um, so it comes back to that is just we, we need to track, you know, there's, there's a protection for them as well. Is because we're doing this, you can prove that you did nothing wrong if someone pointed the finger of blame at you. So they have a place, but they can be creepy if you haven't got the process, the process and the policies in place around them, around what you use them for and how you use them and where the data is being stored. Uh, and also, if you're not having that communication with staff, again, it comes back to why are we doing this? Why, why are we bringing this in? We're bringing this in for reason A, B, and C. We're not bringing it in to um, try and fire you or try and catch you out or do anything like this. We're bringing it in to protect you at the end of the day and protect our customers. So I think they have a place as long as you've got a problem you're solving with them. Okay, maybe if there's no more questions, let's uh, thank Anthony for his presentation. Uh, very insightful and helps us to um, consider a lot of things, maybe from a slightly different aspect than what we'd thought about before. So thank you very much.